So <laughs> this is unfragmented, inspired by Colossians. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Join our book club as we pursue a more consistent Christian life. All right, well, welcome to Unfragmented once again, where Lee Bortons and I explore the cohesion of things believed with things done. And we're just connecting our Christian thought with our Christian action. Today is Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. I'm Kevin Novak, and Lee Bortons is our co-host. And this month, we have been talking about knowledge and power, knowledge and power, the information theory of capitalism by George Gilder. And we we're blessed so far to have Mr. Gilder join us the last two weeks and just listen to him and, and him explain his book to us. Next month, by the way, we will be discussing economics in one lesson by Henry Hazlitt. So if you have not started reading that, you're going to want to get a jump start on that awesome um, book as well. So we do you want to get us started here with some questions and uh, discussion on George's book, Knowledge and Power? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So one, um, he did uh, email me around five o'clock that he was going to be on. So, um, but he's at, in the JFK Airport Hotel. So we'll give the, him some grace. He may or may not, you know, show up. Which I just can't believe he's already given us two hours. So I would have been thrilled with one more. So what I thought we would do is go slower this time than we had did maybe on the first um, uh, episode for knowledge and power. Um, Because the ideas really are very deep and difficult, but they're worth studying. So let me open up with uh, page 32, and I'm going to read you a quote for those of you that haven't. It's page 32. And now I don't know where it is on the page. (laughs) I'll read it from my notes because I was trying to describe it to you. Okay, so Gilder says, um, creativity is always surprising. That is why it cannot be planned or demanded by civil government or even of customers. What, it's on the second paragraph of page 32, for those who are looking for it. So let me read it again. Creativity is always surprising. So let's go slowly. Why is creativity surprising? What do you think he means? Is there, I can't see a chat. Uh, no chats. Okay. I was just gonna say, I wonder if it's because um, if you're creative, you're it's something new that didn't exist before. So you don't know what it, you don't know what it is until it happens. Because it didn't it's exist. unexpected. Anybody else? And at the end of the book, George talks about how socialism is looking backwards and entrepreneurship or capitalism is looking forwards. And if you're dealing with looking backwards, you're only dealing with existing ideas and you're just trying to plan with those ideas. As I read this part, it reminded me of Ayn Rand's book, um, Atlas Shrugged, which I, I was able to read just last year. So it was fresh in my mind. But in terms of um, dealing with planning and dealing with surprise, I mean, if we're dealing with people and in, in the future and entrepreneurship, that's dealing with new things. And socialism is not dealing with new things. So it's not going to be surprising. Mm hmm. Like, because what he's balking against is that uh, the idea that um, customers or government demand things be a certain way. So I think the thing that's hard for us is that I like having a plan. I like when things are not too surprising. So I don't think he means there should never be any plans. I think what he means is that the um, that, that that if there is any new information or any creativity, 
that itself is surprising, but it needs to exist on something. And so I like think, look at the world and I think about how God made the sun, makes the sun come up every day. And I'm pretty much on the same planet every day. So there's some things I can count on. So that's what he referred to as like our low entropy versus the ability to be creative is high entropy and that's where the surprise comes from and that's where the energy needs to be spent. I mean, aren't you guys all glad we don't have to make the earth revolve and invent gravity every day? Yeah. Well, it's, it's one of the things too we can talk about with non-believers where we can point that out to them, where we have a uniformity of nature, we have predictability with matter and with just the way we live our lives and we can use that as a witness to to non-believers. I think there's a lot of people though who don't like surprise. Are any of you that way? I don't know you homeschool. I don't think you are actually, but maybe you are more. Nicole, you look like you want to say something. I would say it kind of depends on what it is, if a surprise <laughs> is good or not, because some surprises I feel like can just throw your whole like having a surprise fourth baby last year kind of <laughs> it was a good surprise but then it you know still threw things off yeah yeah and there's bad surprises coming home to find your house on fire <laughs> i had that happen <laughs> yeah. that that's a bad surprise so it's, it's trying to put it in context. I think what he is just so disappointed in is that we look at monetary theories and government systems and think fixing those is what will make our lives better. And he's trying to say, no, the enjoyment of a life of surprises is where actually all the progress comes. Would mm -hmm. that be a fair synopsis, Kevin? I think it is. And um and i i think i developed that that point more and more as i read the book and, and got to the end of it because george kind of lets loose towards the end and really he gets a little more opinionated with that which i enjoyed he was more forceful um i will tell you you know i'm still i'm still struggling to fit information theory into the way that I think and the way I go about my everyday business, because I think I'm still trying to fit it into the way I think rather than think the way George is presenting information theory. Well, let's, um, let's solve that. Let's look back at that glossary and look again at what he said information theory is to him. Do you want me to go ahead and read it? I'll do that. Sure. So based on the mathematical ideas of Shannon and Turing, an evolving discipline that depicts human creation and communication as transmissions across a channel. So are we okay with communication as transmission across a channel, that that's information? And saying whether a wire or the world in the face of the power of noise with the outcome measured by its surprise, which is defined as entropy, and consummated as knowledge. All right, Kevin, you got the book, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like he's yeah, not quite answering it the way we want him to answer it. Well, and I think that's what's, what I'm struggling with. He's, he's thinking so broad here. And here, obviously, it helps us as Christians when someone brings along a concept that we're struggling with, like even greed or lust or uh, impatience, and then someone can point to scripture and say, look at what Psalms or Proverbs says, and kind of, oh, okay, I can kind of check myself and recalibrate myself, but this does not, and I'm not saying George is wrong, I'm just saying I'm struggling with how to uh, fit that into my everyday life, because to me, getting a flat tire, that it sounds like that would be new information, but that wouldn't necessarily be like good information in my mind i'm usually struggling with what's good and bad not necessarily what what's information and not information so just putting that into your context of your daily life yeah anybody can anybody help us 
Well, so if you're thinking of the feeling you get is bad when you know the information of a flat tire, but that's not necessarily bad information because if you didn't know it was flat, you would then ruin the rim and then cause more damage. So are we are we mixing maybe our feelings about information as opposed to whether it is good information? I mean, because somebody can have a logical argument about an untruth that's not true, but it is a good argument. It it follows the formula to to be good. So maybe we're defining that with feeling instead of the actual knowledge. Well, I think Julie, when you say good, you mean like accurate or true. Right, right. Right. Not the quality of it. And Kevin right. maybe is mixing the quality of it. Maybe. I don't know. Because because he does say it's an evolving discipline, right? That means we not everybody knows how to use it or what it is yet. It's we're getting more. Um, but this let's go to his keywords. It depicts human creation and communication. I think that's where our problem is that we don't think of creation or we don't think of the things we make as being communication. And yet all of them are. So he had that example last week about word, symbol, and object, that trinity, the triad of every idea. So if I create a painting, I use words and symbols to think about it and to describe it. So we think of the painting as a creation, but we sometimes forget it's a communication. And yet we'll go and say, but that art speaks to me. I'm looking at Jennifer. She's in here. She looks like she wants to say something. Well, I, I'm like 10 steps behind. <laughs> so okay, should we back up. Let me back up for a second. So when, when I look at that, creativity is always surprising. I, I was trying to think of some examples. So I also thought of some in art and some in technology. But then when we started talking about bad surprises, I thought, okay, well, what's a bad surprise that prove this, proves this rule that creativity is always surprising and that it can't be planned? And the first example that came to my mind is a, the Apollo 13 mission. Mm. They got bad surprises and the NASA engineers solved those problems with only the things that were in the craft itself. So they ended up then creating another surprise by fixing it with socks and duct tape and whatever else was actually in the craft. So they had this. So I was trying to think how that relates to that. I, I would say that is a good example of that quote, the creativity is surprising. So that couldn't be planned. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the creation too, when you were talking about words and images and um, I mean, I think that is a biblical truth that said, you know, the rocks will cry out. I mean, he says his creation will speak of him, even if we don't. Yeah. So I think George is saying that all, all things uh, are communication, right? They communicate something to us. I'll push you aside. Yes, you're fine. Sitting in an awkward way here. Right. So maybe if we try to use an example that comes from where the scientific application occurred. So that was a good example Jennifer gave us. What about like, so, so one of the questions I have is as a person who's used to Newtonian physics and friction and energy, and there's no such thing as a uh, wheel that'll spin forever without input into it. Anything, anytime any of us do something, we create heat. And yet all of us are transmitting bazillions of bits of information through the air right now that I can't see, I can't feel. It's doing work, but not creating heat, not creating anything that I can feel, right? These, us, our Zoom isn't making my house any hotter. You know what I'm saying? And so it's because, but yet this amazing thing called your faces, pictures of them, is able to be transmitted, which is an amazing surprise because the channel it's traveling across is very smooth.
it's kind of like when you go pay with your credit card at the grocery store and you and I think to myself, how did the bank get the information and know it's me? Right, so I think this is how he's applying information theory is that it's both a physical thing that mathematically was proven and uh, allowed a wireless transmissions to occur, but it's also turns out to be the very essence of human nature and creativity. Oh, does that help any? <laughs> We're all trying. Thank you. I think it's real easy to apply it to, to economics. I think the, at least for me it is, I think the part we're struggling with, at least, well, again, at least for me, is, is trying to apply it to other areas. Um, and I get some of the examples. It doesn't always fit. And I think that's where, like, when I'm driving around thinking about it, I'm like, hmm, okay, what is this? How do I apply it? So. Okay. Let me go to something easier, he said. And it's on that same page. We'll keep thinking about what information theory is. He quoted two people I've quoted a lot now since I read this book. Steve Jobs said, a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show them. And Henry Ford said, if I listened to the customer, I would have built a faster horse. George uses these two two examples to explain supply side economics, which Ronald Reagan made famous because of George's book. Did any of you understand the difference between supply and demand side economics? You wanna give some examples? What were Jobs and Ford talking about? Well, here they're, they seem to be talking about information theory. I will tell you that as someone who pays more attention to civil government authority, when I would hear the term supply side economics, or what some people I think would call voodoo economics, it was mainly cutting taxes for corporations. That's what came to mind when I heard supply side economics, and I'm okay with that. This was good for me, these examples of Jobs and Ford, because it made me obviously think more concretely about what George is saying and say, wait a minute, there's more to supply, supply side economics than just cutting taxes and, and corporations being able to hire more people and lower taxes. It's more about the human capital behind it and the entrepreneurship behind it. So expanded my definition of supply side economics. So can I say it dumbed down? So to, I'm just gonna keep going where you were, Kevin. So we, the, the supply side economics, there was cutting taxes involved, but the goal was to put the money in the hands of the suppliers. So let's just say Henry Ford had been alive at that time. Then he injects the surprise of the car into the market and he creates the demand versus the government trying to create demand for something that already exists. So back to your example about socialism, where it's looking backward, this is looking forward to the surprise of the entrepreneur. So the, the tax side of it was only to incentivize that to happen or to free them up from restrictions. Was that a fair, if oversimplified? No, I think that's I think great. so. Yeah, that's good. That's helpful. I think what my point is that it, this is good what George was saying, because I, I think I was oversimplifying supply side. I was leaving out that human component of creativity. Um, and, and this was very helpful to me and, and seeing that it's people behind products and creating demand, not the civil authorities who are, again, like you said, looking backwards. Yeah, I look at classical conversations as an example of this. When I started promoting classical Christian homeschooling. Nobody wanted it. And yet grew because of the surprise in recovering the classical arts and Christian pedagogy and the family, right? And so what George would say is there's never been anything new and exciting created because customers were clamoring for it. They didn't even know they wanted it. 
it takes that entrepreneur with some surprise and a vision other people haven't had to create the next, uh, uh, you know, big wave of um, whatever it is, technology or education or uh, various systems. So it, it feels like it goes against the grain of what, you know, the average college would teach in a marketing program, right? That you need to, you know, listen to the customer and that's how you develop your products. And it, George would say, no, that's never, ever happened. You might improve on your products. You might deliver them better, right? Because then George also talks about how there's that infant learning curve where every five years you like double your knowledge. And as part of it is because once the product's out, your customers start giving you information. That helps you make it better. But it, the customer rarely makes it so that you find a whole brand new product. Right, they would make it themselves. Yes. <laughs> so I, ha I think this may have redeemed an argument between me and my husband. And I think it's, it's courtesy of you, Kevin. I think you just solved a problem that we have been arguing about for years. So every time my husband would come home and talk about human capital, I would say, stop saying that word. I hate it. I don't, I, to my, to my brain, it sounded like quantifying humans in a way that I just could not get on board with. So when you aligned it with George's word creativity, I was like, okay, I can get on board with that. <laughs> so yeah. I, I can be on board with those two things being a synonym mm -hmm. for some reason that makes me feel better to say creativity and surprise than to say human capital. So I, I, my life is now better. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do bless people when I come upon them every now and then. So thank you. <laughs> okay. You know, we, um, I think in, uh, you had made a note about another quote on page 27 in chapter four, and you basically just summarize it. There's this long quote about how modern economists have basically advised civil governments on everything under the sun, except what matters most, and that's the environment of innova innovation. So we've basically just been talking about that um, and summarizing that quote on that's on page 27 in chapter four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, read it again. Start with failing. The central failure of economics has been its inability to grasp the centrality of entrepreneurial creation and economic life. Here, stop there. To... Just, just stop there. It's too much to hold. Who, who has the book? Michelle or Nicole, any of you got it? Yeah, you do? Okay, so you can follow it. Anybody else want yeah. to go down the line here? Because if you have the book, we'll just go ahead and let them keep reading it. All right, keep reading. Go ahead. I lose them. Uh, can you I'm sorry. Read? Did you want me? Yeah, finish. Did you want me to keep? Just, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, so this is on page 27. So, the the I'm I'm going to go a little uh, farther down the line here. This is five lines from the bottom. Failing to see the centrality of entrepreneurial creativity. Economists everywhere have counseled civil governments to attend to the money supply, aggregate demand, consumer confidence, trade imbalances, budget deficits, capital flows, to attend to everything except what matters most, the environment for innovation. Hmm. So what matters most is the environment for innovation would be one of his theses. You want to do an anti chart? What affirms? What affirms that? That the environment for innovation is the most important thing in an economy. That's what he's saying. The environment. Henry Ford. Henry Ford, the Jones. Wright brothers, the Wright brothers, Steve Jobs. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking of all you know. Cyrus McCormick, um, Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. So I know one thing that um, 
we think about a lot is uh, in to answer your husband's problem and to respond to this too, or your yeah. idea of human resource is, um, you know, I sit there and think, okay, so we, when the government feels like it's failing, should you invest in gold and Bitcoin and land and, you know, whatever, you can go on and on and look at all kinds of things. There's all kinds of good and bad reasons to invest in those resources. But the absolutely only resource I have the opportunity to spend eternity with as people, you guys are our best investment. Mm. I think that's what your husband's saying. And that's what yeah. Gilder says too. It, it, it's us, no matter what else is going on. So, so the environment would be mean to me, would mean we have um, good health. It's hard to be innovative when you're not healthy and have clean foods and clean water. So what are some other affirmations for the environment um, for innovation being important? I think patent laws is a good a good thing. Dependable just laws, is that what you said? Yeah, just being able to protect what you create. I, I will admit I'm on the fence about that in terms of civil government authority, but nevertheless, it it does facilitate people creating and then being able to protect their idea and, and benefit not just themselves, but others. So um, Tori or Tony, I'm sorry, what do you mean by knowing what consumer desires needs? Is this older or is this about the environment for innovation? Yeah. Do you want to talk? I don't know if she can talk or not because she's had a lot of things that she's just commenting on. Oh, okay. Um, right. I think that's maybe an environment she's talking about potentially having, mm -hmm. creating a, a way that we know um, the needs of the consumers. Um, and if the government's funding thing, do you really know the needs or the wants of the consumer? No. <laughs> you don't. no. I mean, I mean, take the vaccinations. And so it was interesting. I was listening this morning talking about, um, you know, these pictures, these pictures of Trump surfaced as if he was being arrested and it was all generated by AI, artificial intelligence. And, and the other side of that is this new artificial intelligence is taking over our language. So like, what is the, what is the thing where you can speak into, like, write me a paper on classical education and it'll write it for you? What is that called? Chat GPT? Yes. Yeah. So all of this artificial intelligence is um, coming out. And I think that when you, when you replace, again, people um, who actually, they, that artificial intelligence cannot come up with an, uh, an individual um not individual thought, a creative thought, a thought that didn't exist unless somebody put in words for it to find. It is not intelligent. It's mm -hmm. stupid. I mean, it ha it cannot come up with a creative, um, but it is a fast way to hijack our language because it can take away, um, it can change meanings or it can actually send you something that is not true. But yet, again, looks like real words that I use every day, and and but it's not real. It's and it's not intelligent. Um, so I think that's a way where we're actually going backwards and creating an environment for that by using thinking it's progress, but it's not. Yeah, we got off with uh, Adam Andrews talking about literature and how the authors of all these books we were talking about were because it was all children's literature were celebrities to us, famous people that we could recognize the author's name. Well, if everything's written by somebody named Chat GPT, <laughs> like what author are you going to be looking for? It dehumanizes us. <laughs> well, I think I had mentioned before, and I mistakenly was attributing it to knowledge and power, but I was also listening to George's Life After Google and in that, where he talks about closed systems and, you know, artificial intelligence being a closed system where there's like Julie was talking about, there's nothing new. It's, all, it's only inputs. And then thereafter, it's a closed system. And so that, that does 
that's a great example of of where there is no creativity. There's nothing penetrating it from the outside to make it to make it new. And as we had talked about before, analogizing us with like God, God is informing us, the Holy Spirit's informing us, and we're we're making things new within this creation. Um, yeah. Original thought, that's good. Yeah, it's pretty wonderful how, how he made us. So let me ask you this question then. Go to page 46, and I'll give you a second to get there. Give me a second to get there. There we go. And at the top half, first paragraph, he says, wealth actually springs from the expansion of information and learning. So I have a question for you homeschoolers. How many of you feel richer because you home educate? Yes. Yes. So yes. a lot of people think the education homeschooling is about bringing school home for our children's sake. You guys want to share any stories about what you've learned by being a home educator? Or what surprised you about them? <laughs> what I didn't know. <laughs> you thought you were educated? Is that what you're saying? It turned out you were just schooled? I was just schooled. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I kind of think for me, because I was a trained government school teacher, mm -hmm. and we're kind of only told just like so much, like, limited and i had no idea something like what a classical education was or anything like any of those other people like even like a charlotte mason and when i made the decision to homeschool and just doing a search and just all these other things and all these other ideas came out that i didn't even know existed so i know i didn't want to do it one way because this way was not good and learning that you know kind of a surprise in a sense that there's just a ridiculous amount of different ideas and ways to do it and curriculum and and all of that so it's like I've been learning how education and parenting go hand in hand instead of seeing them as like separate things the way I was like trained if that makes sense yeah thanks for sharing that with us Nicole anybody else would okay Tony read Tony's for us Julie she said, interesting that God creates out of nothing, original thought where IE chat GPT collects and regurgitates. So she's referring back up. Love yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Very astute. Sorry, I'm in an airport. Yeah. We're, we're traveling to. Are you with George? With George? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right, so I want to go ahead and look at the beginning and the end of chapter six. So on page 47, well, first, the chapter is called The Extent of Learning. Okay, he says, Smith, okay, he's talking about Adam Smith, who wrote Wealth of Nature, Nations. He says, Smith's vision of the entrepreneur as a tool of the market rather than its creator constitutes the original sin of what we call demand side economics. So we talked about supply side a minute ago. How does this help us or not with the, uh, understanding demand side economics? Hmm. Maybe the next sentence, can you read it? Julie, do you have the book? Read the next sentence aloud. It kind of answers that question. I do not have the book, no. Oh, Kevin, you wanna? Um, wait, you're, you're on page 47? Yeah. Let's see. Or we can have Jennifer read it. So, Got it? Celebrating. No, after celebrating. Smith. Yes. Oh, Smith. Last paragraph. Last Smith. Smith posited an imperious pre-existing market pulling in the entrepreneur who serves it. Okay, so it's, why does Gil, uh, Gilder think that's wrong? 
he calls it the original sin of demand side economics. I, I have thoughts on it, but I don't know if it, I mean, I would, I'd have to think a little more about that being the original sin and why. I think my thoughts on it are, and I think it's colored a little by an interview that George did with uh, Peter Robinson. We watched some of his Hoover Institute institution videos where George talks about the division of labor being kind of an end and that and that being something that was a goal and once you got there you were done whereas the entrepreneur being the source of on supply side economics is the beginning and that fueling everything so i don't know that that's addressing exactly the original sin but that's what i think of when i read about that being it, uh, a huge problem in terms of um siding with either supply side or demand side economics. Mm -hmm. So is Gilder then arguing that the market is infinite? Yeah, I think he would. Mm -hmm. hmm. What do you mean when you say infinite? Do you mean numbers of people and money or something else? Well, just, yes, I think so. Let, let me see if I, so because he, he goes on to say that the problem that drove Smith and scores of his followers to predict that growth would end in a stationary state so that there's some kind of point at which there would be no more innovation. And I think Gilder is saying that doesn't exist as long as there are people and creativity and surprise, there will be innovation. There's not some kind of ultimate state where that just is bound. Yeah, I was next door neighbor to an economist from the Carter administration, and he told me one day, sitting at the lake, watching the kids swim, he said, one day the government economists would know so much about all of us and what we do that there would never be anything new to know. He actually said that to me. And that reminds me of what was in like the late 1890s or something. They, uh, they were going to close down the patent office because everything had been invented. Yeah, it also, well, good. it also brings us to a lot of our sins of civil government because they suffer from this illusion that information is finite. And if they can just get enough of it, they'll make the best decision. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that separates Christians from everybody else is because people who don't believe there's a God, I, I just don't know how their imagination works because by knowing there's a God, yeah. it explodes yeah. all the more things you can think about because you're not limited to this universe but beyond so i think that where that okay. comes from that man will know more than we'll ever we can know yeah so if i i'm sorry this okay. may be totally a tangent but if you think about i always tell my chemistry students you guys are learning about subatomic particles that didn't have names when i was growing up because we didn't know they were there <laughs> so <laughs> and probably that is a bottomless well just like the stars and the galaxies may be a bottomless well mm -hmm. just like the market and innovation are mm -hmm. Don't you think, though, that you, well, I, I know I'm doing this right now. I look around at all the technology that exists, and I think to myself, we have come close to inventing everything that we could invent. And I know that's not true. It's just I have a hard time thinking about what else could be out there. I have ideas about what could be explored more, mainly the mind and the universe, but I have a hard time thinking about technologies that we're going to invent that don't exist now. Does anyone else think that way or have trouble with that? And one of the things I did want to ask George was, what does he think is next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted him to explain more about graphing because I imagine he thinks there's things coming from that. Well, it's hard to describe what we don't know, Kevin. Mm -hmm. People do it though. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that what a science fiction novel is? That's true. Right? Yeah. And then, you know, Jules Verne describes some kind of craft to the moon and, and then there it is. There it is. It becomes it mm -hmm. the story came first. Mm -hmm. hmm. I know as a homeschooling mom, if I could beam myself to different places, I would be very happy. As in <laughs> Star <you> Trek. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, that's hmm? I just said that's something. I was going to follow up. Sorry. No, oh, good. No, I was reading beyond where um, Jennifer was reading um, that next paragraph towards the end of it. It says the obvious conclusion is that only the regulatory state with its antitrust powers can prevent the deterioration of a free economy into an oppressive regime of giant monopolies too big to either innovate or fail. Let's, let's read think- that again. That is an important sentence. The obvious conclusion is that only the regulatory state with its antitrust powers can prevent the deterioration of a free economy into an oppressive regime of giant monopolies too big to either innovate or fail. So what's the regulatory state? I, I think that that yeah, it's our it's the laws. Yeah, in other words, what he's saying. The question before helps to understand. He's saying that only the um, regulatory state can dislodge an entrepreneur, and mm-hmm. that one just makes me so mad because you know I've always been very entrepreneurial, and I look at young people today who have the same gumption and attitude I did, and. You like, you know, we could start businesses when I was a teenager without starting a nonprofit or a for profit. You could just knock on someone's door and sell them something. (laughs) And then you and then you honestly paid on your C form on your taxes the income you made. They can't do that anymore. No, kids can't even have a lemonade stand anymore. Right. (laughs) So good. So is this what we see happening right now in banking in the sense that, so we look at it and say the banks are failing and the federal government will have to intervene. But what is also true is that the federal government would like the smaller banks to fail so that they have a few banks that they can regulate. Right. That's what's going on. So they're, they're, they have skin in the game to make sure that the smaller Mm -hmm. banks fail. Right, right. It's too hard for them to control. It, and it makes me ask the question, how did we get to this point where we don't want anything to fail? We don't want our kids to fail. We don't want big businesses to fail. We don't, we don't want um, the, well, those two things. I can't think of a third thing. Well, but. I would put it in that why is security more important than freedom? Right. So that's it. We, we don't want them to fail because they'll get hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. when I talked to my challenge three students about um, the westward expansion, I was like, so you're heading out on the trail west you stop at the trading post in st louis and buy your final supplies what you don't buy is travel insurance there's no trip insurance there's no life insurance there's no wagon insurance i mean i don't think those yeah they were just less risk averse they valued the freedom higher than the security no and michelle i mean the whole thing is that that creativity and that surprise so Insurance is another example. Um, it used to be in the first few Apollo missions when the astronauts went into space, they would all sign memorabilia. All three of them would sign the same pieces of memorabilia, so that when they, so that if they died, their family had something to sell because the government didn't insure early astronauts, so they hmm. left something valuable behind in case their wives needed insurance because they left. So so, like, we don't even think of this stuff anymore. Well, and who is it that said, um, as a people, we would rather be taken care of than free? Who said that? Prager just said that recently. Yeah, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, you know, even even back, um, I mean, our our very constitution, you know, it, to be to be what it is, we need people who will be surprising, who are going to be trustworthy. So our nation could not be founded on people who had 
um, you know, a bad moral foundation. That's why even the atheist people who who signed our documents recognize the importance of a Judeo-Christian values, and this is how a nation will survive um, in freedom. Um, but you know, when you take when you when you make people feel that they don't even have the ability to be able to go and vote on their own, like you can't even do that. You you can't even go get a driver's license or some sort of ID to do that. So let us do it for you. Let us and uh, the welfare. I mean, all of it, all of it has created what we are now seeing our generations of people who who don't need to work because it's all getting done for them. And they're, and they are fine at the status at the stat, you know, staying right here. They don't need to be free. They just need to get that check um, yeah. and be taken care of. Well, that, and that's freedom. They have somebody else's money so they can go do what they want <laughs> to them, which to us is like, that just feels backwards somehow. It just feels backwards. Yeah. So Nicole or anybody here at the end, Gary, uh, Tony, know you're in the um, uh, airport. Do you guys have any comments before we finish off for tonight? Being willing to trek untraveled paths and paralyzed by fear. Yes, Tony, I think you you trek. We know you're going somewhere. Yes. Nicole, have you enjoyed the book at all? Um. I don't know if enjoy is the right word, but I have definitely glad that I made myself read it because I would have quit if I wasn't in a book club. So I'm <laughs> okay. or, so like I'm learning and challenging myself in a way I would have normally just been like shut mm -hmm. this book off after the third chapter. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does make me want to continue to learn more about something like this um i don't know that's probably the best way i can describe it yeah i probably should have had to start off with men in marriage because it's a lot easier read to introduce you to george but um i think through this i know kevin you've gotten to look at his life after google and and you know just his technology books he's quite an extraordinary person isn't he mm -hmm. yeah and you know i'm 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 gonna I'm in the same camp as Nicole. Like I just, it's nice to have other people pacing me and, and uh, holding me accountable to reading it. But what I am so excited, I know this is going to sound cheesy, but I am so excited that I have been introduced to George's works because I'm looking at his list right here and I just can't wait to, I really want to read the Israel test and I really want to read men in marriage. Um, and it's just, it's it's great. Every now and then I think to myself, I don't need to be exposed to new ideas because obviously in my simple nature, I think I I know everything. Like I've kind of settled in my worldview. And then George, you know, kind of, I know he's an older gentleman, but he kind of comes along and figuratively uh, punches me and, and shakes me up a little bit. So it's just really good. And we've been blessed to be um, shaken up a little and kind of rethink a lot of things and I know that's happened to me, so so it's been great. Well, I wanted to ask all of you because um, George, of course, uh, he didn't make it tonight, and so that might mean he doesn't make it next week either because he actually is in Poland um, next uh, Thursday night. So, could each of you find a like three quotes? Those of you that have been coming on regularly, because um, new people won't know this. And uh, let's let someone besides me ask the questions. I want to hear what you really are getting out of this. So, Michelle, I appreciate that you just read that couple of sentences to us. It's a better book club when you all get to participate. So we'll see you next week. Thanks, okay, Lee. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Goodbye, Michelle. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.